Years ago, while reading Harry Fan's Gettysburg to Second Day, I came across a paragraph on page 307 that I found interesting. Actually marking it in my book, it tells of Captain John Bigelow's batteries deployment along the now Wheatfield Road. Fans tells us when Bigelow's battery reached their assigned position, where today the regimental monument stands, Lieutenant Alexander Whitaker would attempt to deploy his section on the far left of the battery line. Whitaker soon noticed that a rise of ground just south of the road would block his section's field of fire. Instead of moving forward to the crest of the rise, placing his section in front of the other four guns of the battery, Whitaker would move his section across the rear of Bigelow's four other guns and place his section on the far right of the gun line. Today, while standing near their monument, you can see that same rise of ground just south of the road that Whitaker would see. Also, the regimental monument tells us that the monument itself marks the left of the battery line. This video is not to share the incredible exploits in Bigelow's battery, but for us to see the topography or lay of the land they saw. The rise of ground Whitaker observed, the ridge that hit General Barksdale's 21st Mississippi's advance as they approached the Trussell farm lane at Bigelow's second position. These overlooked features are still there. We need just take the time to notice.
Noted in the regimental history of the 9th Massachusetts Battery by the writer Levi Baker, he writes of the retreat of Bigelow's battery from their first position. You could not limber up, but connecting the trail of your guns to your limbers with a rope or prolong in order to keep your alignment correct with a slow, sullen fire, you allowed the recoil to withdraw your guns, keeping the sharpshooters back with canister and ricocheting solid shot through the ranks of Barksdale's men. It was now six o'clock in the afternoon. So well had you kept the enemy in check that you might have withdrawn through the narrow gateway in the wall and reached our lines. But Colonel McGilvery again came up. He said, except the defense you were making, our lines were entirely open from the foot of Little Round Top to the left of the Second Corps. And he ordered that at all hazards, you should continue to hold the position you were in until he could establish a line of artillery behind you. Your retreat under fire was cut off by the stone wall. Your flanks were exposed, and a swell of the ground in your front allowed Barksdale's advancing line to approach within 50 yards. 
You had already been fighting steadily for two hours and a half, most of the time at close quarters, and had suffered heavy losses. Though delay meant that your sacrifice must be complete, you promptly obeyed the order to halt, double shot with canister, and lay the contents of your limber chest by your guns for quick work. Scarcely were you prepared before the enemy appeared above the swell in your front, and again you were actively engaged firing canister and cutting the fuses of your case shot and shells so that they would explode near the muzzle of your guns. The enemy kept reforming and charging, but each time your heavy fire repelled them. The left section under Lieutenant Milton, by its recoil, became untangled among some large boulders and was ordered to be taken out. As soon as the fire of Milton's guns ceased, Kershaw's sharpshooters, being unchecked, quickly came up on your left and poured in a murderous fire. At the same time, Barksdale's men, the 21st Mississippi, came in on your right flank until finally the very unusual spectacle was witnessed of the enemy standing on your limber chest shooting down the cannoneers who were still serving their guns against those in their front who continued to rally and charge. Such fighting could not last long. Thus surrounded, men and horses were soon shot down and you were finally overcome, but not until the purpose of your sacrifice had been accomplished. 